Two points on a sphere are called antipodes if they're on exact opposite places on the sphere. So, for example, myself, I'm here in Cincinnati, Ohio, that's about there, and this spot exactly opposite is somewhere down here in the Indian Ocean. Now, the question is, do these two points have the same temperature? And, and probably the answer is not. But Perhaps it's the case that somewhere on the planet, there is a point and its antipode that does have exactly, exactly, exactly the same temperature. But then, if that's the case, what about the pressure? Uh, is there a spot on the entire planet where a point and its antipode have exactly the same temperature and exactly the same pressure? Could I do the same thing about temperature and pressure and humidity? Could I add more and more variables? Well, the answer to this question is going to be given by a theorem called borshik ulam but before I get into Borshek Ulum, I want to say thank you, because we have managed to hit on this channel 10,000 subscribers. And I'm just really excited about this. This channel started because I was making videos for a online discrete math course of only 20 students. And that was my goal, that was my ambition. So that we've got over a million views, that we've got 10,000 subscribers, that we've got all people from all around the world, that's very exciting to me. Coming up on this channel, there's gonna be a lot of cool stuff. Uh, many of you have subscribed for my discrete math or my linear algebra playlist. I'm going to be iterating on those playlists, adding new videos, improving them as I go and teach the courses once more coming up in the spring, coming up in the summer. In the spring, I'm actually releasing an entire new series all about calculus too, so there's gonna be a whole bunch of videos about that. And finally, we're gonna be doing more videos just like this one where I take just a cool topic, it's not related to a specific course, it's just something that excites me mathematically and hopefully will be exciting to you. If you like that idea, give this video a like. And now, let's just do some math. Mathematicians have a special name for the circle of radius one. We call this S1. We mean by this the one-dimensional sphere, and it consists of all points in the plane that have a distance one from the origin. Now, what we're going to be interested in studying is continuous maps that take as an input to some function, take as an input this sphere, this S1, and as an output you just get the real numbers. And I usually think of those as just being the x-axis. So here's an example of such a function. It takes this S1 and it just squishes the entire thing down onto the x-axis. So the input is S1 and the output is the real line. This is not the only way we can do this, so here's a different version that also takes S1 and also squishes it down to the x-axis, but it does it in a more convoluted way. Finally, I have this example, and this example is a bit weird. Actually, it's not continuous. Uh, when I mean a continuous map, what I mean is that if you have two points that start close together, then they're going to end up close together as well. But in this case, you have these two points that start to close together at the beginning and end up very far away. So this one is not continuous. Now, the question is this. If I have this function that transforms the sphere into the real line, is there a pair of what we'll call antipodal points? So an x and a minus x that are on the opposite sides of this one-dimensional sphere that end up at the same spot. So for example, in the very simple vertical projection one, if I take the north and the south point here, then they're going to begin on opposite sides, but after you compress it down to the real axis, they end up at exactly the same spot. However, if I take the north and the south point, but I apply the other function, the weird one, well, they don't end up at the same spot. These two points end up somewhere quite different. However, I had to go and animate this, so I know what the function was, so I was able to solve it, and indeed, actually, if you take these two points, so not quite the north and south point, but shifted a little bit from that, those two points do end up at the same spot. So then the question is, this business of finding a pair of antipodal points that end up at the same location, does that sometimes happen? Does that always happen? What's going on? Now, I can ask the same question up a dimension. So, now what I'm going to study is what we call S2. This is the two-dimensional sphere, and it consists of all points living in three dimensions such that there is a distance of one from the origin, M much as there was a distance of one from the origin in the two-dimensional plane before. So, this is called S2. And then, likewise, we can ask, is there a pair of antipodal points where if you have a continuous map that takes the S2 to the two-dimensional plane, notice the two stays the same here, so a two-dimensional sphere to a two-dimensional plane, such that the f of x is equal to the f of the minus x. As an example, uh, if we take the same sort of vertical compression thing going on, well indeed, this sort of north and south pole that we have here 
end up at the exact same spot when you flatten this out into a disc. Here's a slightly funkier one. I'm going to go and send these two points, which are also on opposite sides, and they're going to squish by this cool thing and also end up on exactly the same spot. So there's the question again. Does this sometimes happen or does this always happen? The answer to all of this is the borshuk oolong theorem, and it says that if you have such a continuous function from the n-dimensional sphere to n-dimensional real space, for example, the two-dimensional sphere looks like a normal sphere and it goes to a two-dimensional plane, but either way, Sn to Rn, then there must be one of these funky points, one pair of antipodal points where f of x is equal to f of minus x. And that's the borshuk oolong theorem. Okay, now this has many different important consequences and some of them are just really kind of pleasing. So here's one. Let's do a one-dimensional one first. This is a model of the Earth and I'm going to focus in on the equator there. So I've highlighted the equator and I've put a pair of antipodal points on it. Now, what is my function? Well, I'm going to say my function takes that point on the equator and assigns it to whatever the temperature is at that particular point. It's a temperature function. So, in other words, we're going to have a map from S1 to the real numbers. Temperatures is just the list of the real numbers. And if I go and try to plot this as I take these two points and I move them around, what I'm going to get is a whole bunch of different temperatures. I've just made up some random temperature function here, but as my points go around the equator, then both the main point and its antipode have a different temperature associated to it. Now, if I freeze it, notice what happens. There's these two different yellow points here. This is where the temperature at the red and the temperature at the blue are the same value. This is an example where the f of x is equal to the f of the minus x, the point on the opposite side of the equator. Now, what I want to do is I want to argue that the one-dimensional case is actually going to be really easy for us to verify that it's going to be true. So my argument for it goes a little bit like this. Let me consider a function I will call g of x. And what g of x is, is the difference between f of x and f of minus x. The next thing to observe about this g function is that if I put g of minus x in, it gets the opposite sign, because it's just kind of like taking the g and, and reversing the order of the f of x and the f of the minus x. So g of x and g of minus x have opposite sign. So now let's imagine our points going around on our equator. Sometimes g of x is positive, and sometimes g of x is negative, and it has to get negative, because if I maneuver all the way around so that my x and my minus x have changed places, it's gone from positive to negative. So it sometimes it's positive and sometimes it's negative. Well, we have a theorem for things like this. Anyone who's done calculus might remember it. This is the intermediate value theorem. And it says that if you've got some continuous function, sometimes positive, sometimes negative, then there must be some spot in the middle where the function is equal to zero. And in that case, if g is zero, then that's saying your f of x is equal to your f of minus x. So by quite elementary arguments, we're able to see that the borshuk oolong theorem is certainly true in the case of dimension one. All right, now let's go back up to dimension two. Now in dimension two, I'm considering the points anywhere on the surface of my Earth. So this is now S2. My points could be around anywhere. What about my function? When it was one dimensional, I said, just tell me what the temperature was at the point. But for the two dimensional case, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna let my function denote the temperature and the pressure. And this is really an output in the two-dimensional plane. So, for example, I could put up a two-dimensional plane, a temperature and pressure plot, and then any time I have an x and a minus x, they are just different locations on this two-dimensional plane, this two-dimensional temperature pressure plot. So, indeed, we have an input of a two-dimensional sphere and an output of a two-dimensional real plane. So, the borshuk oolong theorem tells us that, indeed, yes, there is some spot on the surface of the Earth where the temperature and the pressure at that point and the temperature and the pressure at the point that's directly opposite it have the exact same values. And that's just pretty cool. All right, let's go and see a different consequence of the borshuk oolong theorem that's also pretty cool, but is substantially different. This is called a set covering type proof. The idea is this. Let's take our two-dimensional sphere here, and I want to cover that sphere with various closed sets. What I mean by this is I basically want to do some painting. So in this case, I've painted a region that was red, a region that was green, and a region that was blue. Now my theorem says that suppose this sphere is covered by 
n plus 1 such sets. So two dimensions, that means if I've got the two-dimensional sphere, then I can cover it with three, and that's what I've done. Then the claim is that if you do that, if you cover this two-dimensional sphere by three sets, it does not matter how you do it, then the theorem says there must be one of those sets that includes a point and its antipoint that's, that's large enough to include both of those. In this specific example where I've got the top and the bottom, that's sort of the join of these three colors, because it's closed, and what closed means is that you are including the boundary, that pole at the top and the bottom are included in all three colors. So indeed that top and bottom thing are antipodal points included in the green and included in the blue and included in the red. Now, this is actually the best we could do, this n plus 1. If you're in the n-dimensional sphere, you cover it with n plus 1. That's the best you could do. So, for example, let me put it with 4, right? 3 would be n plus 1, and so if I cover it with 4 things, that would be n plus 2 in the n equal to 2 case. So here I sort of put a yellow cap along the bottom, as well as the blue, the green, and the red. But now you can just sort of look at it. There's no pair of antipodes that are in the same color. That, that top north pole... The south pole is now yellow, so it doesn't work any longer. So, indeed, that's as strong as our theorem can be. In order to prove this theorem, let's begin by considering a particular point, x, that's on the surface of our sphere. Now, I have these three different regions, if I'm considering, say, the two-dimensional sphere, so n plus 1 is 3, and if I label the blue region to be r1, the red region to be r2, and r3 will be the green region, then what I can measure is the sort of minimum distance from this particular point x out to any of the regions. So, for example, the minimum distance going from x along the surface of the Earth, so the closest point, as long as I'm constrained to traveling along the surface of my sphere, is some distance d1. And then there's a d2, which is the minimal distance to go from this value x to some point in the red region. And then finally, d3, which is the distance to go to the third region, the green region. Well, it's already in the green region, so the d3 would be zero. So in other words, I get a d sub i, which tells me the minimal distance from my point to any of these different regions. Now, if I want to use the Borsche-Coulomb theorem, what I have to do is I have to have some function that goes from the sphere to r2, in this case of a two-dimensional sphere, but generally from the n-dimensional sphere to n-dimensional real space. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make my function simply be all the coordinates, the d1, the d2, all the way down to dn. That is, for any point on the sphere, you get a bunch of different distances. Those are a bunch of different real numbers. And I put them all up as my coordinates, and that's going to be my function. Now, notice carefully that while I am living in, say, the s2, my two-dimensional sphere, I'm only going to use the first distance, the d1, and the second, the d2. There is a third region. There is a, a d3, but my function has to go from a two-dimensional sphere to the two-dimensional plane, so I only use the first two of them, and that n plus 1 one remains unused. Now, if I apply borsche coulomb theorem, well, I have the applicable function. This is a continuous function. It is a function that goes from the sphere to the plane, and so by borsche coulomb theorem, we have that f of x is equal to f of minus x at some value of x. And if it's equal for the whole function, it's equal for each of the individual components. So I'm saying that the d1 of x is equal to the d1 of minus x, the d2 of x is equal to the d2 of minus x, and so on. Now, this splits actually into two different cases. The first case is that for one of the components, say d1, that the d1 of x and the d1 of minus x would have to be equal are also equal to zero. And if that's the case, if, if this x has the d1 of x equal to zero and the d1 of minus x equal to zero, that means that this x lives in d1. So you have a pair of antipodes that are living inside of one of these regions. Your theorem is done. Now, if that's not the case, not for d1, not for d2, not for any of the di's, then what it means, because distance is always positive, is that this distance is always greater than zero. The di of x is equal to the di of minus x, and that is always a positive number for every value of i. Now, if that's the case, it says that this x value is not in the first region, because d1 would be positive. It's not in the second region, because d2 would be positive. It's not in the nth region, and likewise for negative x. 
So what that means is the only spot remaining is that it is in that n plus oneth region, that one region that we had not considered in our function. It's in that final region. And if that's the case for both x and minus x, we have two points that are antipodes and they're in the same region, they're in the n plus one region. So regardless of these two cases, you get a pair of points that have to be in the same region despite being antipodes, and that is the proof of this theorem. Now, I have not proven for you the borsuk ulam theorem yet. However, I have something for you. One way that you can prove the borsuk ulam theorem, and there are many different ways to do it, but one way you can do it is out of a combinatorical proof called Tucker's Lemma. So you can go and prove Tucker's Lemma, and then you can prove borsuk ulam theorem from Tucker's Lemma. Now, something else that exists is that, well, borsuk ulam theorem is a topological claim, it's something about spaces and continuous functions, that it has a consequence. It is a corollary called Brouwer's fixed point theorem, which I love this theorem. It's a really fun one. And that can be proved out of something called Sperner's lemma, which is a combinatorical proof that is a consequence of Tucker's lemma. Now, I have a video for you. I have proven Sperner's lemma, and I have proven from Sperner's lemma how to go to Brouwer's fixed point theorem. That video is here. So you can go and see that entire video. And the proof of Tucker's Lemma and borsuk ulam Theorem from Tucker's Lemma has a very familiar flavor. So I'm not going to prove it here, but I will let you go and check out the other proof that I've already had made for you. Alright, that is it for this video. If you like this video, if you like seeing more of these general interest videos, please give this video a like. Thank you once again for 10,000 subscribers, and I will see you in the next video.